a lot of people are starting their GAMSAT study now. So I wanted to make a video showing you what I think a perfect study schedule looks like. The good thing is it's really flexible. So it doesn't matter if you have 15 minutes or two hours, you'll be able to follow this exact same process and get really good results. It's exactly what I did to score 77 in section three and 70 overall. And when I was studying for the GAMSAT, I was working and studying. So I could only dedicate about 30 or 45 minutes to GAMSAT study. So it's not about the quantity of time, it's about the quality of time and how you spend it. So that's what I wanted to kind of emphasize in this video is how to best maximize your time. So this process is a four-step process and what I'm going to do is firstly describe all of those four steps and why I think you should be doing those things and then at the end I'm going to go through a kind of worked example of how you could actually apply that process. Okay, so the first step is solving GAMSAT problems. Now, I've made a video before about why I think the ACE of practice material is the best stuff to be to be using. But basically what I want you to be doing is using that ACE of practice material and solving the problems. Now, I know I get a lot of pushback about this because everyone says, well, I need to know the basics before I can even understand what the question's about. And I just could not disagree with this more. I think you really need to be getting into the questions and using that to actually identify what you need to learn. So I get that you might not have done science in 10 years or ever, and all of the words look really foreign to you. But I promise you the best way to actually learn these concepts is to go to the question and start thinking about what do I actually need to learn to understand this? And how can I use that knowledge to actually solve a problem? Because I've seen so many people, they spend hours and hours on Khan Academy and then they go to that practice question and they still can't understand the problem. And the reason they can't understand the problem isn't because they don't have the knowledge, it's because they don't know how to use that knowledge. So I think the best thing you can do early on in your study journey is to actually see how that knowledge can be used to solve a problem. The other reason I say that is that a lot of GAMSAT problems have heaps of filler information. So you actually get better and better at filtering out what's important. And when you see those core concepts come up again and again, you start thinking, okay, that's something I actually need to understand really well, rather than all these things, which are more just filler, filler text to confuse you. So what I would do here in this first step of solving the problem is just have Google open next to you with the problem. So if your hesitation for doing this process is, oh, I don't have the knowledge, well, now you've got Google. You've got the machine with all the knowledge more than you'll ever have in your life or a million lifetimes. So if you still can't solve the problem when you've got all this knowledge, it's clearly not a knowledge issue. It's that you don't know how to use the knowledge or you don't know how to ask the right questions questions. And that's what I think is that reasoning process that I was talking about before, about using information to solve problems, not just knowing the information. So have Google open and just spend as long as it takes to actually solve that problem. And once you've solved the problem, I want you to write down the exact solution from the start to the end, every single step that you had to do to actually get to that solution. So that includes, I had to assume that this word meant that. I had to then find that in the text. I then had to make some kind of conclusion from this sentence. I had to blah, 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 blah. I had to do these calculations. You get the idea. I just want a really detailed list of every step that you had to do to get to that solution. Okay, so that brings us on to step number two. So now you've got your solution. Now I want you to really reflect on the solution. And by that, I, what I guess I'm saying is I want you to look at that solution and think, what stopped me from reaching that solution the first time? So when I looked at it, I had to go on Google. I had to Google all these things and I had to kind of figure it out as I went along. What were those things? So make a list from that solution of basically everything that you didn't do or you weren't able to do or you didn't have the knowledge for from that solution. So you've got your 10 or 15 or whatever steps. So it can be really quite long and you're going to pull out from that all the things that you didn't know how to do. And that's going to be your list of things that you'll study 
which brings us on to step number three. So now you have this list of things and they should be really specific. So instead of chemistry as a study topic or biology as a study topic, which is just useless, you're going to have this list of really specific things. Because if you think about the process for that solution that you're going to have got, it would have been, I had to uh, work out what this meant and then I had to perform a calculation. That calculation required me to add two fractions together or something like that. So it's going to be really, really specific and you're going to have this list of really specific things. And that's perfect because it means that you're going to be really targeted in your study. So you're not going to be going on to Khan Academy and watching some video. You're going to be going to a really specific resource to fill that gap. Now, if you think about it, I've just said that all of these things, all of these gaps, you have identified as part of a solution for a GAMSAT problem. So these are basically your learning objectives. This is what you need to be able to do to solve GAMSAT problems. And these are the skills that will come up on the real exam. So if you kind of make these second nature and you know them like the back of your hand, then when they come up on exam day, you'll be able to do them with your eyes closed. And in my experience with the exam, when you get really good skills, so if you start seeing unit conversion come up again and again or logarithms come up again and again, you get really, really good at those. But then when you see a problem, you're actually looking to apply those skills because you've developed them so much because you know how important they are because you've seen how they can actually be used to solve a problem. So you really develop them, you get really good at it, and then you start looking for ways to actually do that in question. So rather than kind of looking at a question and not knowing where to start, you're actually saying, could I use this skill? Could I use this skill? And I find that that's far more beneficial than just looking at a question and having no idea where to go. And the last thing I'll say about this third step of filling those gaps is when you have a really specific thing that you want to solve, like I need to be able to add together fractions, the resource is very, very easy to find. Whereas I find a lot of people spend a lot of time looking for the perfect resource or what's going to maximize their study the best. But if you actually just define really clearly what you're trying to learn, it's very easy. So this example of adding together fractions is actually something that I found in my study. So I hadn't done that since primary school. And then I found this question that I couldn't add together the fraction. So I found myself on some grade four maths resource or something like that. And that was the perfect resource to fill that gap. So when you're really specific in the things that you want to learn, the resource just kind of comes naturally. And it's not actually about the best resource. It's about the best resource to fill that specific gap that you have. Okay, so we've found our solution. From that solution, we've pulled out all of the things that we want to learn from that, all of the gaps that we have. We've then gone to a range of resources to fill those gaps. And now we're at step four, which is repeating that question. So I basically said, this was the solution. These are the things I need to be able to do to solve that problem. I've then gone and filled those gaps. If I've filled the gaps correctly and I've done it to a high enough degree, I, w- I should be able to go back to that question and solve it without any other resources. If I haven't, if, I've, if I still have a little gap in my knowledge, then I'm not going to be able to solve it. I'm going to be in the same position. And then you just repeat this process until you can successfully solve the problem without any other extra resources. And I find this is a really, really good process to do. Just keep going in this cycle because every time you redo a question, you actually find that there's more gaps. And it's not just these technical skills, like I've been talking a lot about math skills and so forth, but you actually find more soft skills. So how did I draw a conclusion from that data? Could I get better at finding the information? I actually misinterpreted the meaning of a word, things like that. So you actually find that, yes, you've actually got all the technical skills, but you still got the question wrong because you made an assumption wrong or something like that. So all of those softer kind of reasoning skills, they also come out in this process. And those are things that you should be focusing on as well. And I actually find that we put too much 
focus on those technical skills. But when you repeat the problem, once you have the technical skills, you actually realize that there's something else there. And the more that you kind of do this process of solving problems, reflecting on what you couldn't do, eventually you'll get to a place where you can solve that problem. But then in the future, you will find problems that use the same reasoning processes, the same technical skills. And you'll actually find, okay, that's really good because I use this process to solve this problem and now it's helping me on this thing. And I think that when you start seeing those things get repeated through different questions, it really strengthens that in your mind as an important process to be able to do. And that's certainly my experience of the exam. So when I was in the real exam, I found these questions and I didn't immediately know what to do, but I saw little similarities in those questions to other questions that I had done in the Ace of Practice materials. So this is why I often say I do believe that the the Ace of Practice material represents the real exam because it teaches you the skills that you need to be able to do. And if you can do all of those skills, you'll have no problem on the real exam. But I think a lot of people misconstrue representing the real exam with these questions will be exactly the same. So they're never going to be the exact same questions, but the skills and processes that you need to do will be there in the real exam. Okay, so to summarize that process one more time, we want to solve the problems and document the solution. From those solutions, we're going to reflect on the process and pull out all of the things that we couldn't do. We're then going to fill those gaps And once we've filled those gaps, we're going to repeat the question and see if we've filled the gaps well enough to be able to solve the problem. So just before we go to the example, I'd love it if you could like and subscribe. It really helps me out. But otherwise, let's go to the worked example. Okay, so here we have a practice question that I wrote. It's actually something for my uh, practice exam. And I'm going to show you that we can actually solve these problems. I'm going to pretend as if we have no science knowledge whatsoever, but hopefully demonstrate to you that you would be able to Google enough stuff and reach the answer. But what I really want want you to take away from that is how I don't think that studying all of this science content beforehand is actually going to help you out in solving this question. So, Basically, this question is asking which of these, ethane, ethane, and ethine, is the most acidic? Now, I'm going to breeze through this a little bit because I don't want to spend ages, but basically, you'd be looking through this stem of information for anything about acidity. Now, I purposely haven't got any information in here that directly talks about acidity. And that's what I think is a really challenging aspect of the GAMSAT is relating words and kind of drawing conclusions and connections between different things. So what I would hope that you would be able to do is think, well, there's nothing explicitly telling me about acidity in this question. So what could be something that tells me which one's more acidic? So you know, you, maybe you start looking into, you start looking at these things and you start saying, okay, well, they talk about SP hybridization. You know, how does that relate to acidity? And, you know, then you might keep looking through some more and you see this thing about electronegativity as well. So it says the greater the S character, the greater the electronegativity. But then you can also see that these, when it's talking about these SP hybridized carbons, they have, uh, it says they have different S character. So you can start to see that you can relate this S character to electronegativity and maybe that is something that could relate to electronegativity. And when you Google it, sure enough, you can see that there's um, the more electronegative something is, the more acidic something is. So it's not about the content here specifically, but what I want to demonstrate to you is this is how I think you should be going through your study because you'll actually find how something like electronegativity can be used to predict something like acid strength. And I made this question because I have seen that concept used again and again and again in the GAMSAT. They tell you something about electronegativity and make you uh, draw some conclusion about acid strength. And the reason why I think you need to do this early on is because 
all the people that come to me and say, I just can't solve this question. I have no idea what to do. They've gone and they've watched a video or multiple videos on electronegativity. I know that because I've asked them. So they know what an electronegativity is, but they haven't taken away the connection between electronegativity and acid strength. And that's because in the resources that they're going to, it's more aimed at science, um, you know, undergrads or high school or something like that. And that's not necessarily the most important thing about electronegativity there. So you watch this resource, maybe it's 10 minutes long, and they might make one offhanded comment about the connection to acid strength. So if you just look at that video, you're never going to take away the core idea about electronegativity, which is the connection with acid strength. However, if you're going through this question and you're asking yourself, how do I get acid strength? You're automatically thinking, what are the things which determine acid strength from a compound? And that will start drawing you to electronegativity and then you can draw that connection back to the SP hybridization as well. And you start connecting all these ideas and that's how they're going to be assessed in the GAMSAT. So I hope that gives you a better idea of how you can use this schedule in your own GAMSAT study. And as I said at the start, the really good thing about this is it doesn't matter if you have 15 minutes or multiple hours every day to study, you can spend 15 minutes solving a problem. And maybe you don't actually solve a problem, but that's fine. You can just pick up where you left off the next time, but don't leave until you have solved that problem. And as for all the other things, you know, filling the gaps and finding those kind of um, learning objectives that you need to be able to um, do, you can start breaking that down. So if you have a really busy day, just pick something that's going to take you 10 minutes. You can watch a, you know, you can read a grade four maths resource on adding and subtracting fractions. Whereas maybe there's some other bigger concept, like you need to be able to draw molecules and name them. And you know that that's going to take you an hour, hour and a half, something like that. So you can do that on the weekend when you have more time. So it's a really flexible schedule. And as I said, it's what I did. I just went to the questions, found what I needed to learn, learned them, and then saw if I could basically tested myself to see if I'd learnt them to a sufficient degree to get the question right. So it's a really good schedule. It's what I recommend everyone do. It's worked for me. It's worked for a lot of other people. So give it a go and let me know what you think. But um, I hope you found this video useful and I'll see you in the next one.